Hello, and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the situation of the suffering and persecuted church around the world. The Gaza Strip, 10 kilometers wide, 41 kilometers long, home to about 1.9 million people. It is bordered by Israel, Egypt, and the Mediterranean Sea. Ever since the Islamist government Hamas took power, it has been blockaded by both Israel and Egypt, restricting the movement of both people and goods. Some say it's the world's largest prison. To tell us more, it's my great privilege to welcome Sister Bridget Tai, a Franciscan missionary sister of the Divine Motherhood, who has been working for the greater part of her life in the Middle East and now particularly in the Holy Land. Sister, thank you for being with us here today in our program. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Sister, you work in the Middle East, but you're originally from Ireland. Your whereabouts in Ireland? I grew up in the west of Ireland, rural Ireland, many years ago, uh, in Sligo, about 20 miles from the Atlantic coast. My family still live there, so when I go back home, it's where I grew up. It's uh, one place on earth I still can really it's relax. still where it's, you call home. It's home in every sense. In every sense. Was your family a religious family? We were traditional Catholics. Um, my mother was quite religious, but she was a very wise woman. And I remember at one point when we were children, and I was pretty pious, and I wanted to go to Mass every day. And she would say to me, go to Mass every day if you want, but it's not because you'll be able to put your hand up in school and say, I went to Mass every day. She was wanting to say, interiorize your faith. It's not for show. And so I grew up with a very deep faith but not too public. I, when I was a teenager, I went to dances, I had boyfriends, I did what teenagers did in yes. those days. When did the vocation set in? When did you have a feeling, hmm, something, maybe something else there, other than the boyfriends, other than the, the dancing? I remember very well when I was 15. That was before the boyfriends, actually. Um, and I felt that this is something I might be called to, but I waited. And I trained to be a nurse, or I started training to be a nurse, went to England, had the boyfriends, um, but did my study. And then I actually joined the order when I was tw 19, almost 20 years of age. So I'd left, I'd left school young because there weren't many opportunities in rural Ireland. So although I was still only 19, nearly 20, I'd, I'd experienced life a bit. I'd left home, I'd travelled a bit. Did you have any regrets? No, I had no regrets. Life wasn't always easy but I have no regrets. Sister, you joined the Franciscan Missionaries of the Divine Motherhood. Why particularly this order? What is it about St. Francis that attracted you to this spiritual life? It's hard to answer that, but one thing that was significant, but why I was attracted at that age, I don't know. When I was 18 and I was studying to be a student nurse in London, Whips Cross Hospital in East London, and there was a Franciscan church near, and I used to go to Mass there, not every day, but I went fairly regularly, and I met the Franciscans and I joined the third order, secular third order of St. Francis. I think just because I met the Franciscans in that church. And then I read the life of St. Francis and the rest is history. And the rest is history. I'm going to look here because the list is rather long. You studied at Cambridge University and specialized in health management at the London School of Economics. What was Cambridge? And then secondly, why health management at LSE? I had done, I was a qualified nurse and midwife, but in those days, nursing and midwifery was not a university degree, it was not a qualification. And I was assigned to Jordan um, as a young sister. I was already a nurse, not a midwife. And I loved Jordan, and I learned Arabic, and I did lots of things, but I had some place in my heart, I want to study theology. I didn't think of going to university initially. I thought I might do a long course, but I remember saying to my superior general at one stage, I want to study theology, but don't offer me a three-month renewal course or something like that. I don't care how long I wait, but I want something solid when I get it. So by some 
divine providence or something else, I ended up in Cambridge University and I absolutely loved it. You loved it? I loved it. Why did you leave it? Leave Cambridge? No, theology. Why, why did, did I you, leave theology? Why didn't you pursue? Ah, I belong to a religious order, which means I happen to have a vow of obedience. <laughs> <laughs> and so I finished my, my three years in Cambridge and I went to my superior general and I said I would love to go on and do an MPhil in theology and my tutors in Cambridge, my professors were encouraging me too and my superior said, and I understood it at the time, she said, okay, but you went to theology too for your own enrichment, you have developed such an expertise in knowledge of the Middle East and Islam and culture and Arabic language and we don't have many sisters with that degree of, of competence that you've just got by living there. So, you know, we really want you not to waste that, but to go back to the Middle East in some capacity. And so that's when I went to the LSE to upgrade my ability or whatever it would be to go back to the Middle East. You went as a young novice to Jordan uh, to serve as a nurse and a midwife. What was it like when you encountered this culture, this Arab culture in Jordan for the first time? I have to say that in those years we didn't have much missionary preparation. We were just told to go and you go. So I knew very little about the Middle East or Islam or anything when I went. I did know about nursing. I was newly qualified, not much experience. We had a community there, so I was assigned and I was joined the community of sisters who were more experienced than me. And everything was new to me and it was wonderful. I just absorbed you everything. You soaked it in. I soaked it in. And I didn't have the critical attitude to, I mean the critical approach to why are the poor. I just went and served the poor. In, whereas in later years I might have said, why are these people poor at all? I think when you're young you just go and you throw yourself into what has to be done. And that's what I did and I learned Arabic and I did whatever work was to be done. And again, I loved it. I've been very, very um, fortunate in what I have been asked to do and done, that most of the time it was hard work, but was actually enjoyable on many levels, not only on the spiritual level, which you'd expect in serving the poor and that, but also satisfying in that, especially as a young person, you could actually do something to relieve the suffering. And make a difference. And make a difference. That sounds idealistic now, yes, but that's but what it is to be it's young. It's a fact. Yeah, it's yes. a fact, yes, yes, yes. Sister, you're coming as a rural sister or a sister from rural Ireland and you're encountering this culture for the first time. What is it that you loved about the people? And what, is, what was the greatest challenge that you found at the same time in trying to understand this new culture in which you were thrown? The biggest challenge, first of all, is the language. Because ideally, I should and the sister should have gone maybe at least two years to learn Arabic. That's the way to do it. But we didn't do that. We went straight into work and we took private lessons and we learned in the evenings and we tried to study when we could and we learned from the people and you're young, we didn't mind making a fool of yourself. The women especially were great, they'd laugh and they loved it and they'd correct us and that's how we did it. So that was one of the biggest challenges. The other challenge, which was a challenge of a different nature for me and to this day I can remember it. When I went to Jordan first, it was in 1971 and it was very soon after the what they called the Black September War, September, uh, to, uh, nine, what is it, 1970. Um, so the people were extremely poor. We were working in the edge of the refugee camps. We were very poor ourselves also. We were very, very poor. And it, almost every household, it had been a civil war in 1970, almost every household had lost an adult male, a father, a brother, a husband, a son, so the people were desperate. Added to that in 1970, when 71, I went 71, that was only four years after the uh, 1967 Six Day War. When I look back now, four years is nothing. But at that time, it didn't strike me as that. I just went in and I saw the poverty and I saw what was happening. But one of the hardest things was seeing we, had, we didn't have a hospital, we had a daycare centre where we took babies that were sick, dehydrated, there weren't enough hospitals, and we would take these babies and they'd get better, and we'd send them home, and you'd heard they died of measles or something. I found that really, really hard. And I remember at one point, um, first I had the grace of God to realise this in myself, because I was still quite young, 
I said to myself, if I'm going to let this suffering get to my soul, is how I experienced it, I won't be able to help these people. So somehow I have to protect my inner being, uh, still be compassionate and kind, but that's the only way that I can survive here. That was a real challenge. And how did you create this distance? Only in your prayer life, or how did you...? I wonder this day how it was a prayer life, divine grace, because nobody taught me this. You would have nobody. been consumed otherwise. I would have been consumed and I'd, probably, I'd seen it happen to other people. I wouldn't have been able to stay. So you, you know, if you burn out, you get too involved in the sufferings and letting it get to you, you cannot help. And I've seen this over the years with other people. You then, after this principal time in Jordan and the Middle East and your studies, you were then asked to become the director of Caritas for Gaza. And you were the director of Caritas for Gaza for three years. I was, I, I was executive director of executive Caritas director. in Gaza because Caritas Jerusalem's headquarters is in Jerusalem and Caritas has work in East Jerusalem, West Bank and Gaza. But because of the blockade in Gaza uh, since 2007, I think, it's difficult for Palestinians or others to go in and out of Gaza. So I, as a foreigner with an Irish passport, I'm pretty free in how I travel, provided I get the right visas and everything. So I was able to travel f freely, provided I got the right permissions in and out of Gaza. And the then director of Caritas Jerusalem asked me to take over in Gaza because I had a background in medicine and in leadership and in management and all kinds of things. All, of the, all, of these. <laughs> all kinds of things <laughs> yes, came together. God kind yeah. of organized yeah. in yeah, such a right, way. Yes, that's right. It was as every, it actually was as though everything came together in that because I got a medical background. It's a long time ago, but you don't forget the skills. I had the, the management skills and I had experience of different things and I knew the Middle East and I knew Islam and I feel at home here and everything just came together there. Was this the culmination of, of the experiences and the educations brought together for this particular purpose or is this still being lived out in different ways today or both? I'd say more the former because as I've just told you earlier, I'm no longer living in Gaza. I go in and out of Gaza regularly now, but I lived in Gaza for the three years, or just over three years. Then I was asked by the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem to take over as General Director of Caritas Jerusalem, which is a different job, bigger job, but very different job. And so I'm based in Jerusalem, and I'm still fairly new to that. I'm only four years, so I'm still... Getting your feet wet. Getting my feet wet and thinking, have I got the everything it takes now to do this new job? You've got the wrong end of the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. What was your first impression when you went into Gaza for the very first time? The very first time I went to Gaza was I was working in Jerusalem uh, for five years as um, um, vice rector of a theological college, research college called Tantur Ecumenical Institute that belongs to the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. So I was living, working there, and as kind of my outreach to the poor, I occasionally, not regularly, occasionally joined with a little support group for a sister here in Israel who used to go to Gaza regularly. And so I went with her. We would go together, two or three of us. And I have seen poverty, so poverty didn't shock me. But what did shock me on that first trip to Gaza I drove through the beautiful Israeli countryside down towards Ashkelon and down that way. Lovely roads, good cars, lovely countryside. And then you come to the Gaza border, you walk through. And when I walked through the other side, donkeys and carts, rubbish, poverty. It was like a fourth world country. That shocked me. And yet you decided, this is where I'm going to live. Not immediately. I finished five years in Tantour and then I was asked by my superiors to take over as provincial of my order in England. I said yes. I did that. And when I was finished, about four years, I was more or less free. And I talked to a superior general we had, a new superior general. And she was very wise. She said, what do you want to do? People joke with me to say that she didn't know what to do with me, but maybe that was part <laughs> of it, because I had done so many different things. Mm -hmm. And I took time, and I went away, I did a long retreat, and I'd investigated a few other things first, but nothing seemed to fit with me inside. 
And then I went for this long retreat. And I just, not a director retreat, I just had a friend I talked to. And I felt called to serve the poorest of the poor. I thought of trying to go back to Jordan, but I didn't know people there. And I thought the refugees in Jordan, their needs are great. This was three or four years ago. Their needs are great, but they need the big organizations to give them the infrastructure and they can look after themselves. But Gaza was just that time after the 2014 war. In fact, the war was barely ended. And I said, that's where I want to go. Day-to-day -day life in Gaza, how would you describe it for the people who are living there? I believe there are 1.9 million, almost 2 million, two million people. About 2 million people now. Living in an area of 10 kilometers by right. 41 kilometers. Something like that, yes. Mm -hmm. How would you describe day-to-day -day life for these people? All the time that I lived there, there was a blockade, which meant that the Gazans could not leave Gaza by land, sea or air without going through checkpoints. So for them, um, even for myself, you get used to anything. You know the expression, the abnormal becomes the norm. So which for shouldn't people, be, which is shocking. Should not be. It's shocking. I yeah. felt it even for myself. Yeah. So for the people living there, and I got to know them, many of them quite well, because in Gaza, Caritas works all over the Gaza Strip from north to south. They get on with daily life and they do the best they can. It's easier sometimes to give an example of you know, what it was like. So a couple of examples I have. I wasn't very long there living in Gaza and there was a young man, Muslim man, very bright, working with us. And I said to him one day, you know, I hear about what it's like from people like you. My Arabic is rusty, I have to freshen it up, but so you'll tell me what it's like or people will tell me. But I said, when you're with your peers, he was that time 27, 28, married with a baby. I said, when you're with your peers, how do you see the future? He said, sister, we don't talk of the future anymore. We used, he said a few years ago, we would talk of the future and dream of what we could do. He said, now we don't because we don't see a future. So we focus on the present. And I think that's almost exemplary of how people manage because it's especially now in recent years, this was three years ago, there isn't even a peace process. There isn't even a semblance of a peace process. So what is the hope for the future? So people survive and they manage the best they can. Um, you can take different groups of people, the very poor, the Christians, some people have you know, money, there's some good shops. For myself living there, when I first went there, there's a Christian community of, I think I was told there's about 1,300 persons when I first went there. And the local priest and some other local sisters who live there, the local Christian people would say to me, as a foreign Christian woman, don't go out alone, it's not safe. It's not that Hamas, the de facto government, would harm you. The opposite, they'd protect you. But as somebody said to me, you don't know what some crazy might do to make a point or to embarrass Hamas, you don't know what. So I abided by that. I would take a taxi, neighbor, Christian man to Mass every morning, and then I would go out freely with Caritas staff. But I wouldn't go out alone, except just to walk around the little area where I lived. Uh, so I found that very constraining at the beginning. I'd go into my one-room apartment and uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I remember saying to myself at the beginning, I'm going to be sitting here in this one room, which was a big enough room, just okay, with a little kitchen and shower, uh, for the next 18 hours maybe, 3 to 3. And, and after a while, you go, I didn't crazy. notice it. Yeah. No, I didn't notice it. Oh, I see. After a while, I got used to it. We would work later sometimes. I would bring books and I would read a lot and I read some good literature I'd never had a chance to read before and I had Wi-Fi so I could do my emails and I could do some work online. But I got used to it. And that was the impression of what life actually was for these yes. people? Yes. And I used to come out to Jerusalem regularly for breaks and for meetings with Caritas headquarters and I would you know, stay in Tantua where I'd worked before and get a bit of normality. After a while I didn't feel the need for it. I didn't feel the need for it, but perhaps that's what I needed it most. Sister, uh, youth unemployment is at about 60%. Extremely high. And yet the population is highly literate, highly Correct. educated. Yes. How is this? Is it lack of anything else to do? It's partly lack of anything else to do, but it's also partly lack of Palestinians generally having a very high um, desire to be educated, a very high ideal and, and 
um, appreciation of education. Of course, not every one child will, will uh, succeed so well. But those who do in Gaza, there's the government section for, it's almost like a parallel educational system, the government for non-refugees and UNRWA for refugees. And there's a few private schools, Christian schools, not many, some private Muslim schools as well. But most go to government and UNRWA, so they get a good basic education up to the age of 15. And then those who can go on to secondary school, and it's free or cheap. And a lot of them then have no employment, nothing to do, so they go on to university. And there are many universities in, in Gaza. There mightn't be the level of Cambridge or Harvard, but they are universities and they have medical schools and radiotherapy and pharmacy and teaching and nursing and a whole range. The Christians in Gaza, before 1967 there were approximately 40,000. How many are there today? I'm told that at the moment there's something about a thousand, maybe a thousand one hundred, one thousand two hundred persons only. Most of those are Greek Orthodox, some are what we call Roman Catholics here in Jerusalem, they call us Latins because of the Latin language, and then there'll be a few Baptists or others, but it's mostly the Latins, i.e. Roman Catholics, and Greek Orthodox. But total number is about 1,200, maybe less. Sister Gaza is a Muslim enclave. How are the relations between the Muslims and the Christians in Gaza? The Christian community is so small that they're very vulnerable and they kind of keep to themselves a lot, too much maybe. So the kind of, I used to almost describe it to them as you almost put yourselves in a prison within a prison. They kind of want to work in Christian organizations and they'll go to college but then they won't want to look in the job market and of course there's very high unemployment anyway. But they're not, they're not persecuted. They mightn't have equal opportunities but they're protected to a certain extent by the Hamas government. Um, they will, we will have soldiers to protect the churches at the big feasts. We don't ask for it. They send soldiers to protect. And so there's no violence against the Christians. Having said that, the Christians feel very much the minority. They feel um, restricted under what is a pretty strict Islamic law, which governs everyone. Uh, but it's, it's not a bad relationship. There's a good relationship between the parish priest and the local imam. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Now, your work in, at that time in Gaza, you would have been in a lot of serving also the Muslim community. Mostly Muslims. Mostly Muslims. Muslim. Muslim, sure. How did they receive you as a sister coming to help them? Extremely well. Extremely well. They respect people of religion. They respect me as a foreigner. And maybe because I was in authority there in Caritas, but I got on very, very well with the people, men and women. I had no problem. Sister, now you're the general director of Caritas Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. How has your work changed from that time in Gaza? Now you're one step away from the ground, if we can say it like that, much more administrative. Yes, yes. I knew Caritas from the grassroots, so Caritas was not new to me when I was asked by the Latin Patriarch to take on this role. Um, my preference is to be with the people, to be honest, but I was asked to do this and I thought if the Latin Patriarch Jerusalem needs help and he thinks I can be that person, I said, of course, I'm at your service. It is mostly administrative, but a lot of this quite a bit of travel. How am I here today? But it's not hands-on like before. I miss that, but I do willingly what I'm doing. One of the joys of being in Jerusalem, actually, is uh, meeting different people, but there's a wonderful project that started before I came to Jerusalem, and that is Caritas Jerusalem, working with, in collaboration with Christians, mostly Christians, in the Bethlehem area, Bethlehem, Beit Jala, Beit, Sef Beit Sahur, are commissioned by the Pope to produce one million or 1.5 million rosaries made of olive wood by Christians, a few Muslims helping in the Bethlehem area. And those will be given to all the young people who come to World Youth Day. So there's a lot of work and a lot of travel and a lot of administrative work, but there are perks as well. And this is a wonderful project. Sister, just how do you keep your faith? I mean. You, you've seen so much suffering, you've seen so much poverty, you seem, you've seen what seems to be an intractable situation, particularly in Gaza. Um, how do you not get despondent and, and not despair? 
People often ask me, how can you have hope? They'll ask me, do the people have hope? Uh, people cannot live without hope, otherwise you go into despair and suicide, and there's quite a high rate of suicide in Gaza. But as Christians, we must have hope. It's the theological virtue of hope. So I try to maintain and develop the virtue of hope, which isn't the same as being optimistic. Sometimes it's hard to be op optimistic. But another thing that I've taken to heart there's an old priest living in Tantour when I was there, and he'd been around the Middle East for maybe 40 years, American. And he said to me that if one is to live in this country and keep their own integrity and spiritual um, health, I suppose, and everything, he said, you must become a mystic. And I think of that often because How you have to forgive, be open to everyone, take everything to the Lord in prayer, and it's not about saying prayers, it's about being in the presence of the Lord. At least that's how I see it. Uh, whether that has been a mystic, I don't know, but it's certainly been a contemplative, not necessarily the same things, but that helps me. Sister, thank you for having been with us today in our program. It's my pleasure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on our program, Where God Weeps. If you'd like to know more about the work of Sister Bridget Tai in the Holy Land, perhaps how you might be able to help through your prayers or concrete action, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. I